So Sean uh, generously opened up a Zoom share for me so we can kind of have this recorded for everybody to see. But, um, you know, I, I'm going to show you everybody how you can approach the adoption of fine tuning, why you should care about it. How do we actually do it? I'll walk you through two examples. One's a simpler one. And then another one, I actually have a data set collected that y'all can train your own chatbot effectively. Um, it'll be a Rick and Morty chatbot. Um, and then a little bit, where where does everybody want to go from there? Uh, some more sophisticated things that you can think about in terms of parameters, but not only that, like um, I'll take a little bit more question uh, questions so we can dive into people's use cases that they really care about. So uh, everybody's sort of here because you've seen an explosion in the number of models that we all have open, open source. Uh, if you look at the evolutionary tree, I think most people have already seen this diagram, both in the closed source and the open source model communities. But um, it's sort of been an exponential increase in the number of models that I actually view as different technologies and components for transforming human computer interaction. So with this transformation, we at Gradient at least think that there's going to be more AI models. You can argue with me what constitutes a model, but there's going to be more of these embedded LLMs into all of the user facing products around the world. And an example of that would actually be cellular connections that we have. So there's actually more cellular connections. There are people on the earth. Um, and that was kind of a transcendent uh, piece of technology that pushed us forward. And now we have something that's more powerful than most computers were in, the, in our pockets and everybody uses them. Um, what LLMs actually are going to enable are all these different types of use cases that I think, uh, personalized chat bots, anomaly detection, all these type of things that both in the enterprise and all in consumer uh, applications we're going to be using. So um, what do we actually do at Gradient and what, how do you fine tune? Everybody is sort of uh, uh, knows about Llama 2. So all our models that we host are Llama 2 based. Um, we have more models on the, the enterprise side, but uh, we host Llama 27B and 13B for everybody. And you just use our APIs and uh, fine tune your data on top of the base model to both uh, to serve your applications. So I'll kind of show you and walk you through in a collab notebook that everybody can see. Uh, how to do that. Um, and basically fine tuning is just to specialize your model. I want to differentiate this a little bit because pre-training is actually where you inject all the knowledge in because it's the instructor data component of it. But fine tuning is sort of saying uh, it's kind of taking like a, a college student and then getting them a certificate that they're certified in. So it's kind of studying for the exam more so than it is like them going through the entire college curriculum to learn things. Um, and I'll walk you through all an example right now. Um, so the first thing that we can kind of do uh, here is if everybody wants to go onto this gist, um, it's Mark Wong 525 slash AI engineer summit workshop 2023. I have a notebook there. Um, everybody can just open up. And we can go through that. I'll give a few moments for everybody to, to see if you can uh, find that. If you have problems accessing it, um, my colleague Adrian can help you <laughs> uh, kind of navigate your way around it. Um, so uh, you can kind of open that up. It's a bit low contrast. It is? OK. Um, you might want to go to the profile. Where should I go? There. So what I typically do is I go to bigtextboss.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. All right. Great. Sorry, everybody. Putting your eyes there. <laughs> this thing is huge. Okay. Yeah, looks good. Cool. Um, anybody having problems getting to the gist? Want to make sure? Yep. Um, that's debatable. I think in the experiments that we've run in our company, when we're kind of creating custom models, uh, it's a little bit harder. I would argue that if you are eliciting a behavior out of the model, 
it probably was already pre-trained inside of it. You just didn't know how to elicit that behavior until you fine tuned it afterwards. So it's not really like you can call it into doing certain things, but it's not going to be the same generalizability that the base really has. So that's why you kind of call them foundational models because they just compress all this information like a database into it. And then the fine tuning is more like increasing the skill set for that model. Yep. So is that because the fine tuning is always only in one layer or can you find fine um, so our company, we primarily focus on LoRa based fine tuning. Um, so that's frozen, freezing like 99% of the layers and then uh, fine tuning an adapter on top of it. And, but full fine tuning actually changes all the weights throughout the entire model. So um, there are a few implications between the two. Uh, I think it's not one is better than the other, but um, with respect to what you're saying, uh, it, it's more so the case that the purpose of pre-training is to um, basically embed all that knowledge permanently into the model, and then you use fine-tuning to elicit the behavior out of it. If you kind of look at Andre uh, Karpathy's um, Microsoft presentation, you're effectively, the base models don't, all they want to do is complete documents. They don't know how to do anything. But that's the highest entropy. They have the highest entropy at that state. And then when you fine tune, what you're actually doing in a sense is like reducing the entropy of the model. And then when you do RLHF, you're reducing the entropy even more for it to only be guided within certain behaviors. So um, that's why you know you don't really get a knowledge uh, embedding into the to the model or a compression process when you're doing fine tuning. So. Um, if everybody's got the uh, link to the gist, um, I'm just going to walk through uh, opening up the collab and then we can take a look from there. Um, let's go. Okay, cool. Um, so as part of this, uh, hopefully frictionless environment for everybody to work on. Um, if you all go into uh, click on that one link in the collab, you can sign up for Gradient. Um, like I said, we're in L uh large language model development platform. Um, if the sign up flow is basically this, you just put your name, your first name, last name, email address, password, and then you have an account and uh, you should automatically be given $10 in credit to be able to do, you know, whatever you want on top of the account. I'm just going to sign in because I already have a login. And I have two workspaces over here. Choose whatever workspace that gets created on this uh, login flow. I'll let everybody have like a couple minutes to to sign up. Um, if anybody's having trouble on sign up, let me know. Yeah. You want to share the link? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Go. Well, I'll give everybody like a minute or two to log in on here. Can somebody raise their hand if they've already been successful signing up? <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Just want to make sure I've uh, one of my engineers over there. He can help if we're having any trouble there. But um, from that standpoint, I'll just kind of move on since a few people have been successful and we can kind of go through this webinar. So once you've signed up, um, you'll get a I'm going to run the first uh, set of things. So um, in the first two cells, uh, I'm just downloading a library for you to put in your access code without revealing it to everyone keep it secure. And then creating AI is our um, uh, PyPy uh, SDK. So our Python SDK to be able to hit the endpoints and have convenience functions for uh, our service. Um, specifically, 
the way that you can do it in the UI and find your access token is you just go into access tokens here, and then you can generate a new access token. You gotta put in your password there. All right. So then you get the new access token. And then when you run this cell, it's gonna ask you to put that in. So put the access token in. And then if you look back on your workspaces, you have a workspace ID over here. And I'm gonna to choose to use this work, particular workspace for this uh, example. So you can add that in here. And um, when you run the cell, we, we basically just show the, the set of base models that we support currently on our public service. Um, you have Bloom, which is kind of a tester, hello world-ish uh, model. And then we have Llama 2, um, the chat, the instructed version of it, as well as the, uh, we have a fine-tuned version of Llama 2 called News Hermes. That's the 13 billion parameter model. For this demo, I actually suggest you use News Hermes 2. Um, because it's pretty powerful and it's pretty well instructed. Uh, how many of you know what um, a you know instruction are familiar with the different instruction formats like Llama two, Alpaca, um, Open Assistant, all that type of stuff. So instruction formats are what the mo the pre trained model was um, uh, fine tuned on. So after a model gets all this compressed uh, set of knowledge that's just raw string and all it's learning is next token prediction, what OpenAI and others, Google actually was the first to uh, uh, figure this out, was that if you provide the model with something like this, like an instruction format, the model starts learning how to communicate to human beings and it has an interface for actually doing things that are useful uh, rather than just completing, you know, raw text. Um, so you're reducing the entropy to make it, you know, more accessible to human beings. So for the, for uh, the set of instructions that I'll show you as data points when you're fine tuning, they're going to follow something like this, where um, this uh, part in the beginning just tells the model, this is the beginning of the uh, string of instructions that you should learn. And then this is the end of the string of instructions you should learn. Note that these things are actually like, this could have been anything. This could have been uh, uh, explanation point P or any of those type of symbols. The model just learns it during the process of um, fine tuning of next token prediction. So within here, you're, I, I have it here where it's a prompt text. This is where you'd probably have some sort of instructions sort of, you know, teach me how to uh, code in Python. And then the response might be like, the first thing you need to do is download Python and then you need to uh, install an ID, all that type of stuff. And that's where the response text is. None of it is uh, hard. It's just string formatting here. So on the next cell that I'm going to run, I'm going to create uh, a base model. So the get base model cell, if everybody runs that, you create what we call a model adapter. And that is... Um, uh, it alludes to the fact that we use Laura fine tuning. So an adapter is just a set of uh, unfrozen weights that you're going to be training during the fine tuning process. And we keep 99% of the model weights frozen. That allows us to have really, really performant fine tuning um, training runs for everybody. And, you know, allows us to scale as a startup without spending a th uh, spending money on a thousand GPUs to support everybody's use cases. Um, so, I have a new model adapter and that it serves as the thing, the object that I'm going to fine tune on. Um, from here, uh, we're gonna have kind of a fun little exercise. We're gonna teach it what a foo bear is. And it's an inside joke at our company because one of our um, our developer advocate is from Australia. So she wanted to have like um, a foo bear that eats Vegemite and eats poisonous spiders. So, um, What's happening here is I am running a query on the base model. So we haven't fine tuned anything. We're just trying to see what the base model actually knows and uh, under the hood. And it should know basically nothing about it. So um, you note that in this instruction, I follow the same exact format as I did up here. Sure. 
Um, what nation what yeah, we can there it's uh configurable. You can configure the adapter um with certain parameters that I, I'll go in a little bit later for everybody on the more advanced uh part of this uh workshop. Um so as you can note, it kind of follows the same format. So keep that format in mind. You know, your three hashtags and then instruction, three hashtags response. Whenever you ask for it to complete something that you want, you're asking a question, you always leave this part blank because you want the model to effectively um, respond to you. And that's how it learns to respond to you. So as you you can see, it's just asking it, what does a foo bear look like here? And then, um, you know, I kind of run that and foo bear is a fictional creature, so it doesn't have a specific uh, physical appearance. And, you know, it, it doesn't know anything about this animal. So then I'm going to fine tune it in a few examples. So you'll note that I have uh, formatted the instruction strings this way, and then I'm fine tuning it on um, a set of different concepts, like what do they eat? What are the predators of this animal? What is its coloration? Uh, where do the foo bears live? So keep in mind this response here. Let's just run this and then see uh, what happens afterwards. So I'm just going to run this and um, get a response out of it. And we can see the difference. For the purpose of the time, there's another uh, um, there's another longer query that I need to run. So I'm just going to kick it off right now um, where we have uh, an example where you can actually fine tune the model to emulate the voice of a character. So um we have a huge data set there if you look on the gist that i had um i have a train uh hyphen you know um json l oh oh that's because i didn't add that data file but uh as you can see here now we have uh a little bit more knowledge injected well, not knowledge, but like the, the model sort of learned the concept of a foo bear. So it's a fictional creature, does not ha uh, have a specific universally accepted appearance, um, artistic uh, description. Um, that's an interesting response, actually. We probably need to train it a little bit more is my um, takeaway from this particular <laughs> query. But um, in all cases, the instruction format will be vital to you having a su successful training run. So you're always going to have to have some sort of question or some sort of uh, concept that you want the model to to learn. And then the response will be vital for training it on. So you kind of have your facts that you want the model to kind of understand and learn. Um, any questions before I move on to the longer example? Yeah. What is the multiplier? Sure. The multiplier is the uh, Laura multiplier. Um, that means that during the training process uh, for your Laura adapter, the, the larger the multiplier, um, the faster the model should converge uh, during the training process. So it's kind of uh, a sliding scale with uh, epochs. So if you want to train for more epochs, you want to overfit the model more, you can accomplish similar things using a larger lower multiplier it gets more interesting actually if anybody knows like stable diffusion text models have a similar sort of ability to stack multiple lowers on top of each other and therefore the lower multiplier can actually serve as like overweighting certain as stylistic aspects that you care about um so uh i'm actually gonna go past this example really quick clean up after yourself uh whenever you create these models and then um, I'm going to upload a data set. I'll show everybody what the data set looks like in a second. It should be on the um, the link that I provided in the gist. So I uploaded the data set. There's about 357 lines in here. Um, if you run this out, do the same thing. You query, the, you get the base model, which is News Hermes, and then you have to pass it in to create a new model adapter. Um, again, that adapter is the thing that you care about. That's the custom model that you want to work with. Um, I'm going to, this is probably going to take about five, 10 minutes to run. But if we look at the data that I provided it, it's a kind of a little fun, little example that we have. Whoa. Okay. Um, 
here are a bunch of instructions. I can't word wrap that. Sorry. Um, we took a bunch of dialogues from Rick and Morty, and then we turned that into uh, an instruction data set. So as you can see, you have instruction response. And our goal uh, in fine tuning this is to see if the model can respond in the the um, in the voice of you know Rick from Rick and Morty. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time. So th this data set has like 357 examples that we have to fine tune up on. Yep. Uh, that's on this, well, we were talking about pre training. Mm -hmm. um, Someone originally asked about pre training versus embedding when we were talking about that. Uh, so I was talking about pre training fi versus fine tuning. Okay. And then um, learning knowledge versus learning skills. My question is the fine tuning versus embedding. You know, what's what, what they overlap, so, uh, I they're kind of separate things. So embeddings are nothing more than turning text into vectors, and then uh, it's useful for retrieving like long memory knowledge. So you'll have a lot of people kind of synonymously talk about embeddings in memory. So all of that is is if I take a the encyclopedia and I embed all the documents there. I can use the cosine similarity to retrieve relevant context that will be sent into the model at query time. As um, your model doesn't learn anything on it, it's actually just giving it the correct context to answer the question the correctly. Approach, the approach of, hey, I'm going to take my information, create the embeddings, and pass that to the model at runtime uh, versus I'm going to fine tune it ahead of time. Because you can sometimes get a good response if you're passing the embeddings mm -hmm. to an existing model that hasn't been fine tuned for that data. Yeah, so I agree. I'm just curious to the approach is that fine. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a time and place for uh, either. Um, I would argue that you should do both. I think a lot of, I mean, the narrative these days is you should fine tune on your embeddings and fine tune on your model, and you'll get the best performance out of it. I uh, sort of our narrative at our company, at least, is you want specialist models that do really well. Um, interesting. I have a timeout here. Uh, I'm going to try to run this again, but may, perhaps uh, why everybody can try to run the example. I think there's a, too much traffic on the on the server at the moment, so we kind of timed out. Um, I you know. I'm super glad to take any sort of question and answer for, for folks. Yep. So maybe related to the question of embeddings versus fine tuning. Um let's say the example we know we have a million blocks of thousand emails. Um presumably there's some knowledge in there and you have some service in what so um the questions that I gave to people. So I can either find through the model on my existing emails, email as well, or do some kind of drag or roll. What do you think about that? Uh, if something is about knowledge retrieval, I would argue that you embed the specific facts and knowledge into the vector database or index them into the vector database. And then, um, if something is like a stylistic voice of you want the model to actually respond in your voice rather than like a robot, uh, you would want to fine tune on your emails that way so then they would kind of work in a complementary fashion because like what like i said it's it's not sort of saying you want more knowledge it's more saying you want that certificate right like you want to be a google certified uh database engineer having that certificate means that you're good at that specific set of tasks but it doesn't mean it doesn't reflect all the other things that you could do right so um with that it's just more reliability i think fine tuning has shown um, at least with our enterprise customers, that they really want more reliability and repeatable behavior out of the models because you reduce that entropy um, of the outputs that way. Yep.